Hello everyone. It's about the top of the hour here. So we're gonna go ahead and get started. As you can see here, I'm not Heather. Um, I'm Joanne. I'm also one of the community admins in the maintenance community. I'll just be stepping in for Heather for this webinar. Uh, so thank you all for joining us today. Um, if you're not currently a member of the maintenance community Slack group, we would love to have you join us. Um, I'll add a link in the chat on the right. And uh, today we have Susan LaBelle joining us for a presentation on driving asset availability through cost-effective maintenance strategies. Um, I'll let Susan introduce herself in a moment, but I know we're in for a great presentation. Um, just a few more things here. Um, the recording from today's session will actually be available in the Slack tomorrow, alongside with a copy of the slides that you see here. Um, Susan is also available to answer any questions live in the Slack group, so feel free to share uh, the recording of this webinar or an invitation to the Slack with any friends, colleagues, um, anyone you would know that would benefit from hearing some of Susan's expertise. Uh, the final piece of housekeeping before we get started, you'll notice your cameras and microphones are turned off. Uh, so what you'll do if you want to ask or answer any questions for Susan, you'll use the chat feature right on the side, uh, right side of the screen here. So just chat your questions as they come up and we'll do our best to answer as many as we can. Um, if there's any questions we don't get to, we'll answer those offline in the Slack community as well. Um, well, that's all from me. Uh, thank you again to Susan for being here and for everyone else to joining us today. Susan, I'll turn it over to you to get started. Thank you so much. Um, as Joanne said, um, my name is Susan Lubell, and today we're going to be talking about driving asset availability through cost-effective maintenance strategies. Be more than happy to do Q&A at the end. If there's something burning, pressing questions, Joanne will read it out to me as we go along. So quick biography always hate this part, but you need to know who's talking to you so you've got confidence that what I'm telling you actually is up to date and uh, current thinking on where things are. My uh, day job is I'm the principal consultant with Step Consulting Inc. I'm coming with an engineering background and I, as you can tell between my MBA, my MMP, my CAMA certification and my current role, industry association roles with PMAC, with World Partners and with the GFMAM, I really work hard to stay up to date and current with the latest thinking in the fields of asset management, maintenance and reliability. Okay, so now on to the interesting part, why you have all logged in here today and decided to uh, spend an hour, probably your lunch hour, joining us. Today, what we're gonna talk about is first up, we're gonna define some of our typical equipment performance measures or our asset performance measures. We're gonna talk a bit about the business value from improved availability. Um, then we're gonna talk about developing our cost-effective maintenance strategies, okay? Um, as I said, you've got questions. If they're urgent, type them into the text and they'll be, uh, I'll make sure that I answer them as we go along and otherwise I'll catch them at the end. So. First up, one of the first questions you may have asked yourself when you tuned into this webinar is why does asset availability matter? So let's start by setting the context. Many of you might be familiar with this timeline of our assets or our life cycle. We spent a lot of time upfront building the right assets and effectively we're creating production capacity in this phase of the life cycle. This phase is usually one to three years, although it probably looks longer on this uh, particular life cycle chart. And then we move into this operate and maintain phase of the life cycle, where our main goal is to use and maintain this capacity that we've just created or built. This operate uh, and maintain phase can last anywhere from 10 to 50 or more years. Um, I've been at sites which uh, are pushing 80 to 100 years of continuous operation. And this is really the bulk of the time where we spend our efforts as maintenance reliability practitioners. And finally, we're ready to retire that capacity, abandonment, reclamation, recycling, selling it to somebody else. So you might be saying, nice picture suit, but what does this actually have to do with the topic at hand? As maintenance and reliability practitioners, um, one of our key contributions to delivering value from our assets, which is really what is asset management, okay, is to uh, deliver value, that very heart of asset management is around maintaining the capacity to produce. 
And so we do this through creating asset availability. This means when we have a sales order that comes into our manufacturing plant that we can produce the product in the quantity and on the deadline we desire. It means that if we work in a hospital during a pandemic, we can ensure that the support systems like the oxygen, the pressurized air and the electricity to run that key equipment is available when those patients need the beds. In other words, we have asset availability. So let's to look at our common equipment performance measures. So what, three of the most common ones here, availability, reliability, and uptime are like three legs of a stool. And we need all three for our stable production. I've included them here and I've gone back to the, uh, probably the worldwide, uh, what do you call it? Go-to resource for the definitions, which is the SMRP best practices, the fifth edition. Okay, so as you can see, what we've got here is availability is equal to all of our scheduled uptime minus all of our downtime over our scheduled uptime. Okay, one of the most common things I see when I go out to uh, various production sites is that everybody has a different way of calculating these equipment performance metrics to try to make their particular site look just a little bit better. Okay. We need to know that we're, com we're looking at them on the same basis. So I tend to go back to those SMRP best practices references. And I would encourage you to come up with pulling uh, common definitions. Okay, again, from the SMRP best practices, one of the things that we start to look at is how do we influence or maximize our availability? And as you can see, our total available time is really made up of two components. One is the available to run and the other is our downtime. Easy to see on that available to run, the uptime, okay, we're actually running, we're producing our product. Awesome, we are good to go. Our idle time though, okay, our equipment is still available to use. Okay, so we've got max availability, everything that's over there on that available to run. Okay, if our sales department can sell it, uh, we can produce it. Where we're really trying to go here is to minimize our downtime, okay? And when we're trying to, uh, maximizing our availability is really about focusing, as I said, on this limiting or minimizing our downtime. So we have to ask ourselves, how do we do this? Generally, it's through a focus on cost-effective maintenance strategies. And it impacts both our ability to minimize both our scheduled and our unscheduled downtime. If we look at the examples of the scheduled and unscheduled downtime, we can really um, put a lot of effort into shortening the time that the asset is unavailable. Okay, this is things like uh, better planning, scheduling, integration with supply management for our parts, making sure we meet those tight turnaround windows. All of those sorts of things, uh, less intrusive maintenance for our PMs and that sort of thing. But one of the key drivers is really the maintenance strategy that we're following for a given asset. So the less time offline for maintenance, essentially our downtime, the more asset availability we have. So now that we've talked about this, why does it matter? There's really, when we're moving ourselves, we've talked, about, uh, we've talked about our timeline and our asset life cycle. We've now talked about our definitions. And now let's move into where the business value is. There really are two aspects to the cost of downtime. One is the cost of any of the maintenance tactics we perform. Okay, so this is our labor costs, the parts used, the repairs made, all of those sort of certain things. And those are relatively easy to track and figure out. But one of the more frequent and the biggest cost driver is what we call lost production. Okay, so these are the production volumes that we couldn't produce or weren't able to produce because the equipment was offline. In other words, our downtime. In a very simplified business case in a production environment where we can sell everything we produce, where we have continuous production and no redundancy, the cost of downtime can be quite considerable, okay? As you can see here, if our production is 100,000 items per day, whether you're making liters of soda pop, processing barrels of oil through a refinery, tons of fertilizer, uh, boxes of cereal, any of these things, 
If we've got a profit margin, very simplified, remember I'm continuous production, so 24-7, 365 and no redundancy, what would be a 0.1% improvement in the volume produced? I'm sure you can do the math in your own uh, plant for your own environment, okay? There's a fair amount of dollars at stake here associated with this production loss or the inability to produce due to the downtime. I'm sure many of you joining us here today are in not-for-profits, municipal services such as hospitals, water, wastewater, um, emergency service or transit fleets, roads, those sorts of things. Um, and you're saying, well, we don't really make a profit. Well, the reality is these concepts of production loss are just as applicable in the not-for-profit sector. With our current uncertainty in economics and more increased demands due to the pandemic, it really becomes a matter of spending taxpayer dollars wisely and justifying it. So we really do need to consider the cost effectiveness of our maintenance strategies in all of these environments just as much as we do in a for-profit company. The next key thing that I'd like to encourage you to take away from this has to do with the time. Okay, so our previous slide used a 0.1% improvement in our volume produced. Okay, so making a profit off of that volume produced as an example. Okay, the key takeaway, and if you learn, if you take away nothing else from this presentation, this is a big deal. 0.1% is about nine hours a year. So you're asking yourself, how did I calculate this? 24 hours times 365 days is 8760 hours a year. Okay, 0.1%, I round it off eight and three quarters hours to nine hours. It makes the math a little easier as you go along. So one of the things that we need to think about is you in your area or where you work, um, how often do you experience a, a failure of more than nine hours of downtime for either an equipment failure or to perform your maintenance activities? How often is this occurring? It's not unusual to have pieces of equipment out for 48 hours a year, which is 0.55%. Okay, so these are, oops, just flipped ahead on my slide here. One of the things that we want to think about here is how do we minimize this downtime? When we're aiming for maximum availability, we're really, and cost effectively, we're really looking at how do we capture back nine hour increments a year? So now where do we start? We've defined asset availability. We've introduced this concept of production loss, which is essentially the business side of downtime. And as I said, when we're in a situation where there's no redundancy and high demand for our product, whether it's electrical, gener electrical power generation, um, right now I, I see this, there's a hospital that's fairly close to my house and I see all of the ambulances coming constantly. Um, essentially, when there's a high demand for our product and services, we can sell all we make. This really encourages us to increase our asset availability and to uh, strive towards cost effective maintenance strategies. So where do we start? Okay, there's sort of a maturity and a growing, um, uh, growing impact and maturing of our asset maintenance strategies as our plants and our understanding of maintenance management grows. By default, you have a maintenance strategy for your piece of equipment. Even if you do nothing but meet the bare minimum regulatory requirements, that's a start. If you work in a highly regulated industry sector, that level of uh, basic regulatory requirement may actually feel like an awful lot of maintenance. However, that basic level of maintenance doesn't necessarily improve our asset availability as most of our traditional um, maintenance strategies and tactics require the equipment to be offline, either to fix it after it breaks, sometimes called run to fail, or to complete what we typically think of as fairly intrusive maintenance, either on a time-based interval, so every so many hours, days, calendar, that sort of thing, or perhaps usage-based. If you're in a transit fleet, you may be uh, looking at the kilometers or the miles driven, okay? So our minimum maintenance or our minimum maintenance strategies typically meet those regulatory requirements and everything else is kind of run to fail. Sometimes we end up with basic PM or preventive maintenance programs based on what the original equipment manufacturer recommends, industry practices, 
experiential knowledge or what we've always done around here. Key thing to remember here is that those OEM manufacturer recommendations have absolutely no idea what your operation looks like. Are you working in forestry products and that filter is clogged with sawdust every 20 minutes it feels like. Perhaps in reality it's once or twice a shift. Um, or is that filter system going in and it's the fourth level of filtration in a pharmaceutical manufacturing plant or a hospital and it doesn't tend to get clogged quite as quickly there. Okay, so when we're starting out, that's where we go. How many of you can relate to this particular chart? Okay, so early in our career or early in uh, starting off a maintenance pro or maintenance strategies at a new facility, okay, one of the things we ask ourselves is if this thing breaks, will the plant plane crash and burn? If it's yes, fix it before it breaks. If it's no, we have to ask ourselves, is it cheaper to fix it before it breaks? This could be a combination of the repair costs as well as this production loss. And if it's not, just let her go, okay? So one of the things worth remembering is that our goal here is to increase our availability. And our goal here is to choose a maintenance tactic or a maintenance strategy that is both cost-effective and minimizes our downtime. So we start to see the early stages of preventive maintenance programs, maybe our, and as I said, at this stage of our maturity, usually our PMs are based on OEM suggestions or what we've always done to fix it before it breaks. Now, I'm sure some of you have seen this a million times out there, but I'm also betting there's a couple of you that uh, this is new to. So for those of you who have already uh, well steeped in the reality of failure patterns, I'm just going to refresh your memory. Okay. Um, one of the things that we need to understand is that over the past 60, 70 years, primarily from the airline industry and the military, we've uh, seen really a better understanding of how equipment fails. Because we do maintenance and we set up our maintenance strategies at the failure mode level, it's really important to understand what are the failure patterns that are associated with the failure modes, okay? So we have essentially six failure patterns. The bathtub is our high end. So along the bottom, uh, what we've got is the time along the bottom and the y-axis is the conditional probability of failure. If we look at the bathtub, um, this really means we've got high initial failure. So right after we've installed the piece of equipment or the component, um, or after we've done intrusive maintenance, we've got kind of a random wear out period throughout the lifespan. And at the end, it wears out, kind of like human beings. Age related is really this steady failure increase. So nothing different at the beginning there, you know, it's just kind of random through its lifespan and it wears out. And we tend to see this a lot where our equipment comes into contact with the product. So rotating equipment, such as a pump impeller that pumps a mildly abrasive material, compressor, valve seats, seals, conveyors, those sorts of things. Then we've got our fatigue related. Um, and these ones we often see increased failure, um, but no def definite wear out period. So this often affects equipment under high sec cyclic load, um, pipe erosion, uh, tires, those sorts of things. And we often see patterns A, B, and C associated with fatigue, corrosion, evaporation, those sorts of things. Over on the right-hand side, we've got three more failure patterns. The first one is around initial low probability of failure. And so when it first goes in, and typically we see these when men, major um, components were manufactured in a clean environment and then put into our service, such as hydraulics, robotics, those sorts of things that were assembled in a very clean, sterile environment. And then we've just dropped them into our mining operation or our oil refinery. Random failure, completely no pattern, purely random. And our infant mortality, high initial failures after our going into service, followed by completely random failures. So the big question, and you don't have to, you can answer it in your head, which pattern do you think is the most common? And I'm just gonna pause for you to think about this.
All right. So, ta-da, I need a little drum roll here. The research has really shown that less than 20% of failures are time-based and over 80% are random. And so of these, the uh, most prevalent is a pattern with a high infant failure followed by simply random with no wear out period. So what was known as the infant mortality. With that infant mortality being such a high failure pattern, um, does it really suggest that doing more maintenance than necessary may actually be contributing to the failure? Okay, particularly intrusive maintenance. Okay, and how is it best to do maintenance on equipment? For the most part, completely randomly. Okay, remember our goal here is to keep the equipment online as much as possible. So we're moving our way from don't fix it if it's not broken. Okay, which leads us to a lot of run to fail, a lot of uh, surprise. We've got an unscheduled downtime repair, but it's really moving from this don't fix if it's not broken to wait until you see signs of the potential failure. Okay, and then what we're going to be doing with this is scheduling our ability to react to it and to execute the repair on a tight timeline all about maximizing or minimizing our downtime, maximizing our availability. Okay. Predictive maintenance techniques help us to identify these potential failures while the unit's running. This allows us to minimize this offline time. Again, why are most maintenance programs time-based? Okay. Another memory refresher for some of you, and it might be new to others. Along the bottom here, we've got time and on the left hand axis, we've got condition. So the equipment condition and I've got performance standard. Okay, so what we're asking ourselves is the old definition of a failure was that the equipment had failed and it was completely broken. Okay, but we know most failures don't occur instantaneously. So at some point in time, the equipment fail, the equipment begins to fail. Okay. And the failure deteriorates to the point where it can be detected. And this is really our potential failure point P. Okay, so, no, so whatever predictive method we're using, point P is the point at which we can tell that it's starting to fail. If the failure isn't detected, it's, um, it will continue to deteriorate until the point where it reaches that what we're calling functional failure. So this is the new definition of failure. It's now defined as the point where your asset fails to perform its function. For instance, if you assume that you have a pump that needs to supply 100 gallons a minute of water to the process, when the failure actually starts is when that pumps can only supply 99 or 98 gallons a minute. So we say that the pump has functionally failed. We don't have to wait till it gets down to zero gallons a minute, okay? And reliability is really now being defined as the point where that equipment fails to perform in, um, according to its intended function. The amount of time that elapses in between when a potential failure occurs and when it deteriorates to the point of functional failure is known as the PF interval. Okay, so the key thing about this is that when we are between the P and the F on our timeline here, we have time to take the piece of equipment offline in a controlled fashion and execute our repair. And we'll have all the planning, we'll have the scheduling, we'll have the, all the parts there, we'll have the right trades there. A key part of this is around minimizing that downtime, okay, with our execution of our predictive maintenance, and also for any repairs that we require. If we think back, we're trying to maximize our availability of that equipment. And the easiest way to do that is to control or minimize that scheduled downtime, or worse, the unscheduled downtime. Okay. So but now that we've talked about failure patterns, we've talked about this PF interval, and we've talked about our default maintenance programs or our default maintenance strategies, okay? Let's talk about how we get more cost effective. One of the um, more common ways to cost effectively optimize your maintenance strategies, both effect existing ones and the from, from scratch. Okay, so first off, let's talk about RCM 
for reliability-centered maintenance. So what is it? It's a highly structured process that helps you to determine the most appropriate maintenance strategies and essentially a cost-effective maintenance strategy. It really starts with the premise that I do not have an existing maintenance strategy. I have no existing maintenance program and I need to build one from scratch, essentially from the bottom up. It's highly based on a specific operating context, and it's important to understand your economics change with your operating context, okay? And it walks us through seven basic questions. I've pulled this out of RCM2 by John Mowbray. There are a lot of variations on this, um, streamline this, that, and the other thing. For myself, I would encourage you to go back and read the original RCM2 by John Mowbray. I think uh, one of the key reasons for that is when you understand the fundamentals of RCM, then you can make an educated decision over what you might be giving up if you shortcut the process at all. Okay. Um, so I've gone through this myself. It does take a lot of time because you're starting with absolutely no existing maintenance strategy or program. It absolutely will drive you to figuring out the most cost-effective solution because you're doing economic calculations throughout. We're going to understand what that piece of equipment needs to do. And we're going to make sure that as we're going through this, we get the most cost-effective maintenance strategy. But I will not kid you, it takes quite a while to do. A huge, big effort, even bigger rewards out the other end. I absolutely... Um, I, I learned an incredible amount by applying this methodology and we got a super cost-effective maintenance strategy that allowed us to maximize our uptime there and increased our availability. But we do need to understand um, what, what the benefits are for, what, for the effort that's put into. Realistically, sometimes, I'm not trying to downplay it, uh, but realistically, sometimes this is more than we need for less critical assets. So those that don't have quite as severe a consequence of failure. As I said, RCM is really about right-sizing your maintenance program. It allows you to maximize your production, minimize your downtime, which drives our asset availability. It is robust. It's a very big team approach. Okay, And it can be done uh, before assets go into service as well as after. Now you're saying, okay, RCM, awesome. I've learned all about this gold standard. Now it's a little too much for me. So where do I go? Okay, but it's a huge amount of work and I already have maintenance strategies for many of my key pieces of equipment. Okay, so my key assets already have maintenance strategies. So rather than starting from scratch, how would I apply these concepts of continuous improvement? So plan, do, check, act. Uh, DMAIC, if you're in a lean shop, to what I already do. PM optimization is often a good solution. It encourages us to use, so um, it's really a process that takes a look at whatever our current maintenance strategy tactics are. And what we're trying to do is to reduce any superfluous super super tactics. Okay, sorry about my stuttering there. There's a couple words I still haven't gotten over on that. So what we're really doing is we're going to take a look through our current maintenance tasks. We're going to have interviews with our operators and our maintainers to figure out what failure modes the existing maintenance tasks are intended to address. Okay. And we're going to ask ourselves, are there potential failure modes that are not currently addressed by maintenance tasks? Big hint, if we're still seeing a lot of failures on these pieces of equipment, maybe we missed a failure mode. If we find failure modes that aren't currently being addressed, maybe we get maintenance tasks going to address those failure modes. On the other hand, maybe we're doing unnecessary maintenance tasks as part of our maintenance strategy. We need to stop doing those, okay? So uh, PMO is a really good solution when we've got an existing maintenance program. It kind of encourages us to use that predictive maintenance techniques where it makes sense. This can result in um, our desired increase in availability, but it also recognizes that we don't need to start completely from scratch, okay? Another option here for you developing your maintenance program is really about root cause analysis. 
Now, I presented on this um, a couple of weeks ago. So if you want to go check the upkeep maintenance community, specifically on the topic of RCA. But one of the key takeaways from this is that unexpected equipment failures aren't normal and shouldn't be tolerated. So if we start to see a whole lot of equipment failures, it often points to a misfailure mode in the development of our maintenance strategy, or perhaps that we underestimated the impact of a failure mode, essentially the consequence if we think back to our RCM, okay? Or that our operating context changed. So if I flip back here, when remember when we asked what are the functions and the performance standards of the asset in its present operating context? So right now, what do I need that asset or that complex piece of equipment to do Okay, and then how doesn't it fulfill that function? And when we get down to what causes, what happens, so cause and effect, and how does it matter? Okay, when we start to move our way back and forth, we ask ourselves, how do we predict or prevent the failure there? Okay, I think I forgot to go through this chart, and it really walks you through the details and helps you to make the decisions around what type of predictive maintenance you can do. Kind of get on a roll here a bit. As I said, now you're kind of looking, it's going, well, where do I start? I've got my, um, if this thing breaks with the plane crash and burn. Okay. So fairly simple. I've got my regulatory tactics or regulatory requirements to guide me. I have the OEM manufacturer. I've got RCM. I have PM optimization. Now I've got root cause analysis. One of the key things that we might want to think about is understanding that operating context and how critical the particular asset or complex piece of equipment is that I'm looking at. About two weeks ago, James Kovacevic did an excellent presentation on asset criticality, and I would encourage you on upkeep, and I would encourage you to go look up James's uh, uh, lunchtime webinar there to go see a little bit more about that. I would do it a disservice if I tried to repeat what James talked about here. Other good resources for this, um, Tacoma Zach, Suzanne Greenman, both have books out on conducting um, asset criticality. So now we've got this. And we start to understand um, our fix it when it breaks is being replaced by much more sophisticated maintenance programs. So effectively what we're trying to do is to maintain our equipment for best safety, smallest environmental impact, maximum reduction in uh, all at the all maximum production, all at the lowest overall cost. So essentially, how do we spend the lease or our cost effective maintenance strategies and make the most driving our availability of equipment? Okay, so how do I know which method to use to determine the most cost effective maintenance strategies? First place to do this is to start to look at where in your life cycle your asset is. If your control system is many, many years old and close to obsolete and do, about due to be replaced, there's little use in developing a rigorous maintenance strategy for it. It's almost obsolete there, okay? On the other hand, if I'm working in a commodity or a manufacturing industry, such as electric power generation and oil refinery, steel making, auto manufacturing, there can be great benefit from knowing the condition of my equipment and having a commensurate maintenance strategy um, that fits with it. So when we use these criticality rankings, I, it really drives us to determine how much rigor to invest in developing these cost-effective maintenance strategies. Up front here, if we look at this, back at our requirements definition, design, purchase, construction, and commissioning, this is sort of utopian, the ideal time for conducting reliability center maintenance. Set up my maintenance program, my maintenance strategy from scratch, okay, as if I've got zero happening there, okay. Reality, continuous improvement uh, during the operate and maintain life cycle, we've got some sort of maintenance strategy, okay. Often we start to lean into our continuous improvement methods. So we use our PM optimization, we start to use root cause failure analysis, and sometimes we use RCM here too. Particularly if we have a new piece of equipment that is being brought into a um, complex site. So it doesn't have to be all about the entire asset at that site. 
Okay, sometimes we've got a new piece of um, a specific asset or a complex piece of machinery, and we need to get its program set up to be cost effective from the get go. We may be replacing out an old piece of equipment on a 60 year old site with something new and improved. Okay, and we need to start from scratch to develop that maintenance program. So it's really important to understand where we are in this asset life cycle so we can pick the most cost effective maintenance strategies. The um, cost effectiveness of the techniques is also changing over time. It used to be thousands and thousands of dollars to be able to do vibration analysis or to use ultrasound, ultrasonics to determine whether or not I had a leak in my instrument error system those sorts of things. The pricing on this has gone way down and the level of training and the ability to use it has become way more user friendly here. So we always want to be looking at our existing maintenance strategies and to reevaluate, could we use continuous improvement? Could we do more predictive maintenance? Can the equipment be online and I can use more predictive maintenance to give me a sense of this asset health monitoring? Okay. Remember, all of this increases the online time or the, avail or the availability of that piece of equipment. And in our, when we are able to deliver more from an availability point of view, we maintain that capacity which operations uses and our overall site can produce. It's cost effective. Okay. Now, let's circle back to where we started. We talked about the importance of asset availability and how we as maintenance and reliability practitioners are highly focused on this operate and maintain phase of the asset life cycle. It's really where we maintain the capacity to produce um, and our organizations are counting on us to deliver cost-effective maintenance programs to achieve this objective of greater availability. I threw in, whoops. Try to get this going ahead. Here's our references. So if you download the slide deck, you'll see where I pulled them from. I uh, don't want anyone to think I haven't given credit there. And today we're going to move into wrap up mode. I'm going to come out of the presentation so that I can see you in the text chat here. But I'd like to encourage some questions and comments and a bit of a chat here. So I'm just going to stop sharing my screen. Awesome. Thanks, Suzanne. Um, yeah, there's a few questions on the right side Perfect. of the screen. Now I can see the questions again. Yeah. Okay. So let me scroll back up and they might be just in the order that I see them here. Looks like we've got people from all over the world. We've got a couple of fellow Canadians here, some from Europe. Oh, and I recognize a couple of people who've been in classes that I've taught. All right, here we go. We've got... Um, oh. Usama says, oil and gas industry critical equipment failure patterns are 180 degrees different from the non-energy equipment ones. Um, so I'm thinking this is more of a comment than a question. I have to admit, I've spent most of my career in oil and gas. So, um, you know, I'm going to make myself sound out more than 25 years in oil and gas. I actually do find that when we start to look at oil and gas, you're right, we do have a few more pieces of equipment that do experience wear out patterns than perhaps some of the other industries, but it's still pretty close to that 80-20 split. We have to look across all of our assets and certainly our electronics, so whether it's our control systems, the control valves, all those sorts of things. Um, if we look across the complexity of all of those assets, the office buildings, the infrastructure, um, we do still see that overall pattern um, where we do have about 80% are random failures and about 20% are time-based. I would agree that we have slightly more that does experience wear out patterns, particularly if we've got abrasive uh, type fluids uh, running through our piping. Okay. Um, I see a couple other names that I recognize here. Um, let's see. 
Uh, Steve says, we've applied portions of RCM depending on the time we in, apply enough to yield 80 to 90% of the value. And sometimes he finds it's not worth the effort to get the last small percentages. 100% agree with that. When I've applied RCM myself, I find there is a point of diminishing returns. But I do think that if we um, start off and we really think hard about what we're trying to accomplish in terms of getting and uh, developing these cost-effective maintenance strategies, they really do cause us to question and to understand how are we going to increase the availability of that equipment. Okay, Felix is asking, primary role of the PF curve regarding condition monitoring. The big deal with that PF curve, um, Felix, is that point P is the first point at which I can detect the, the piece of equipment is starting to fail. Depending on my condition monitoring technique, I can push point P further back, so back in time, which is essentially left on the curve, okay? It used to be that we had to wait until we saw uh, smoke or a really noticeable change in temperature before we saw, we knew that we were having a piece of equipment start to come into failure mode. Now we might be able to detect things say with uh, vibration monitoring, we might go from having a couple of weeks of notice to months of notice if we've got high vibration in there. So one of our key roles with condition monitoring and that PF curve is the idea that depending on our technique, we can push point P to the left, so earlier in time and give ourselves a larger PF window. That window is the time that we have the ability to plan, schedule, take the equipment down and execute that repair. Okay, let's see. Uh, Steve says a comment here, it's ultimately strikes a balance to determine those strategies and how to identify which ones to deploy to give you that much advanced warning as possible. So I think Steve is, uh, uh, answered the question during this to make sure that we um, are looking at where we're going with our predictive techniques. Okay. Uh, to find PM intervals for the equipment. Okay. So one of the key things on your PM intervals, it's not your mean time between failure. Um, that's a really common question. And I'm really glad you asked it, Martins, because you're going to let me uh, have a chance to talk about it here. One of the things to think about is mean time between failure. Mean means average. So by the time I hit the mean time between failure, half my pieces of equipment will have failed. I want to go back earlier in that. So when I'm figuring out my PM intervals for equipment, I'm really looking at what that PF interval is. And I'm going to use the kind of rule of thumb is about half of the PF interval, okay? So if the failure wasn't detected, let's pretend my PF interval is two months long, okay? From the whatever predictive maintenance technique I'm using um, is, so it can detect it at point P and F is when I'm at functionally failed. Let's pretend that PF interval is two months. My first PM interval for doing predictive maintenance would be at approximately one month, okay? The reason for that, is if I test and I'm just after point P on that curve, I will have ideally the whole, pretty close to the whole two months, let's call it 59 days to be able to plan, schedule and execute that maintenance work. On the other hand, if I'm halfway through and I did my testing and it started to be detectable one day later and I'm halfway through and at the one month point, I still have a month. So I still have a useful time interval there to plan, schedule, and execute the maintenance work, okay? So Martins, what I'm really trying to do is rule of thumb is about half and then group it together with other work that you're doing that's out there. So you kind of, from a scheduling perspective, it makes sense to send people only out at once. Okay, um, Martins is asking, is maintenance a cost center or a profit center and why does it cut maintenance? Okay. This one is a philosophical question there. What we really have to do when we start looking, so it says, is maintenance a cost center or a profit center? Why does management always cut maintenance budget rather than invest to get better equipment reliability? It's an excellent question and it's kind of a chicken and egg here. Um, 
a big part of this, and it's not really what we're talking about here today, is the modern view of asset management is around delivering value from your assets. And as I said, operations and maintenance work together to maintain capacity and use that capacity. You can't do one without the other. Okay. So if we take a step back and we look at philosophically, what is asset management? What you're trying to do here is get that equipment, reliability, availability, and uptime. Okay. And as maintainers, we contribute to maintaining capacity. Operations turns that into production to meet our stakeholder requirements. Okay. Um, I'm not going to talk about AI. There's a whole lot of things on that topic. And um, I appreciate the question, Osama. I'm not your expert on AI data contextualization tools. Um, I would suggest you go and ask somebody who works with that on a daily basis. Um, optimum peak, Atika asks, could we define the optimum PM cost in terms of monetary value or downtime? Yeah, this is one of the things that you're trying to do when you're figuring out your cost effective maintenance program. One of the reasons I shared with you this very simple business case concept around looking at what is your current profit. Okay, I'm going to assume you're in a for profit company, Atik. What is that bare margin? So if you can produce more through the same equipment with the same people there with the same maintenance program. Okay. You can usually get an extra 0.1% through that equipment. What is that profit worth to you? Okay. And then, as I said, what you're really talking about in terms of time, 0.1% is nine hours. Your question is, um, it's very, it varies a lot depending on what industry you're in and how tight your profit margins are. But what you're really trying to do here is to figure out what PM technique or what predictive maintenance technique you want to use, how often you're going to do this. So back to the earlier question, which asked how often or the intervals. Okay. And you have to ask yourself, okay, what are the dollars saving? And this is why that concept of asset criticality comes in. Sometimes it makes sense to deliberately choose to let a piece of equipment run to fail but it's gotta be deliberate. It cannot endanger anyone from a health or safety perspective. You have to make sure you protect the environment, okay? So if we're just straight up on a financial and economics, you can start to look at where, what are your intervals for this, okay? And what is that predictive maintenance technique? Or um, does it make sense? Okay, Bashir says, uh, RCM can be used at any time in the asset life cycle. Uh, the point during the ops phase is the PM optimization. Um, kind of. Uh, you said most of the companies do more maintenance than required. Focus should go to predictive maintenance when possible. And maintenance teams have possibility to control the MTTR, so the mean time to repair. And most of us aren't taking advantage of it. I agree with most of that. Um, the one thing you can use RCM during the operation phase, as well as PM optimization. As I said, RCM starts with, I have no maintenance program and PM optimization says, I have a maintenance program, but I want to do it better. But I 100% agreed with you that we are should be moving to more predictive maintenance whenever possible. People get hurt when equipment fails unexpectedly. So the more that we can look in advance, the more we know what's going to happen, way safer, way cheaper, way more controlled and much less risk if we can bring equipment offline in a controlled fashion to execute necessary repairs. Um, I've got one here. Where, Hi, Susan, where do you stand on implementation of lubrication systems as part of a preventive maintenance program? Do you involve directly or have any partnerships with a lubrication consultant? Um, I do think that lubrication systems can be a useful part of a preventive maintenance program. It really is very asset context specific. Okay, so um, 
are what kind of lubrication are you looking for what service it is in what industry sector i um i don't have any particular partnership with a lubrication consultant or anyone specific to recommend um, so go and talk to whoever is providing your lubricants and you may be surprised at the extra services that are available from some of the existing lubricant companies, um, but it's very regional dependent and I have no idea what country or what part of the world you're in. So I tend to know the ones at the sites where I've worked, but I can't comment anywhere else. Um, Vinoth asks about RCM2, RCM3. Um, there, as I said, a large part of this one I've had success with RCM2. I haven't had the opportunity yet to do a lot with RCM3, so I can't really comment very much. Regardless, I think it's important to learn the overall method, and then you can make your own technical judgment on, are you going to go at it 100% the pure way to do it according to the textbook there? Are there opportunities to perhaps look at similar equipment in the same context and uh, run complete the RCM once for three or four pieces of equipment? There's a whole lot of different things. I can't really comment on that. I'm sure Upkeep has had other presenters on who will talk more about RCM2, RCM3, the benefits and drawbacks of that. So I'd suggest you reach out into the Upkeep community. I'm not the right person to have an in-depth discussion on one method or the other. Um, let's see. Yeah, Steve brings up RCM asks you, is the task worth doing? And most times in a production lens, uh, it almost always is, is what Steve's saying. And that supports this concept of production loss that I was talking about. The major cost when we're dealing with equipment that has failed or when we're putting in our pre-M programs it's not about the labor to do the repair. It's not about the cost of the parts. It's all about that production loss. And one of the things that I found for myself, after I learned the RCM methodology a good 20 years ago, and then I started using it, even when I'm doing PM optimization, I keep thinking back to those failure modes. You, you will never think about your maintenance program the same way twice once you've gotten into this RCM, because you're always asking yourself, is this predictive maintenance task technically feasible and is it worth doing? Okay, and production loss helps us answer that question of worth doing. Availability, downtime, is it worth doing? Okay, um, I'm just looking. Osama, I told you I'm not gonna talk at all about AI and data contextualization. Um, we've got somebody asking about spare parts before the asset fails. So um, what factor? Oh, okay. So John, I think I understand your question. I could be off here. To me, one of the key things here around understanding your spare parts is really that the maintenance function tends to set the demand for the spare parts and supply management fulfills it. So as we start to put in predictive maintenance, maintenance from an M&R perspective, we can say, you know what? I understand my failure modes. I understand my patterns. Um, I'm going to, hey, supply management, I'm going to need bearings. Nine times in 10, I'm going to give you four weeks notice. I'm doing my vibration. I'm doing all these other checks. I'm going to give you four weeks notice that I need new bearings. One time in 10, I'm going to give you four hours of notice. And then supply management, who are the subject matter experts in, in understanding those stocking levels for spare parts, can use that information to decide how many to keep on the shelf. Um, spare parts uh, uh, highly also depend on where you're located. If you're in a major center, um, I have expedite delivery of spare parts using a taxi cab and they've arrived within 20 minutes. Um, if I'm 300 kilometers north of Yellowknife at a mine site, it, it's a flight and we need to stock more spare parts on site. So any of the spare parts stocking strategy is highly dependent on 
the lead time from when I place that spare parts order, um, how long it's going to take to get there. And it also depends a lot on how much predictive maintenance, what that PF interval is, and how much time or warning I can give the warehouse folks that I'm going to need that spare part. Okay. Um, so Tim says, how do we manage inspection frequencies of equipment with some components on predictive maintenance while a few other components are on preventive maintenance? That often happens. It's um, that what you're really talking about here is a lot more having to do with uh, uh, scheduling here than we're talking about with our downtime. So I would encourage you to work with your schedulers on this. One of the key things around inspection frequencies is we need to understand why we are inspecting. Is it a regulatory requirement? Um, and often we see those where the regulations say, thou shalt inspect this not longer than this many days. Okay. And other components are on predictive maintenance. Um, sometimes it comes down to a risk-based decision. Can any of your components, which are on time-based or usage-based, could they be converted over to predictive maintenance? Depends on what component you're talking about and what technique. Sometimes you can't. You simply have to stick with that uh, legislated or regulated PM interval, in which case your schedulers can do a good job of opportunistically scheduling it. So everything that could get done gets done within the same window. So to me, that's really a scheduling thing. And I'm sure the upkeep has got these great experts on planning scheduling that you could check out their, um, their intervals, uh, their presentations and their webinars on that one. Okay. Um, let's see. I'm just taking a look at the time here, Joanne. So... Do we need to uh, cut it off here? Because we have got two minutes to spare. Yeah, no, definitely. Thank you for answering all those questions. Um, if there's any more questions after this webinar, I'm happy to provide those to Susan and we can uh, supply the answers in the maintenance community Slack group. But um, yeah, we can definitely end it here, uh, seeing that we only have a few minutes left. Um, thank you again, Susan. That was an extremely informative presentation. I'm sure all of our participants gained a lot from that. And thank you to our watchers for um, asking such great and thoughtful questions. Those are some really good questions I think a lot of people can benefit from. Uh, but yeah, again, the recording for this webinar is going to be provided um, in the Slack group along with the slides. And then any questions you have, feel free to post it in there. Um, and I'm happy to send that over to Susan. Um, any last words? Well, I, I'm getting all these thank yous and I there's no way I can keep up with typing you're welcome that many times. So <laughs> I really appreciate all of you who logged in today and I hope you to had a couple of takeaways. Yeah, thank you so much, Susan. And thank you everyone else for watching. Have a great day. Great. Bye everyone. Bye.